We have a special guest, Mr. Ross Bryant is going to be speaking about nation state threats and open source software supply chain. But before we get him started, I would like to thank St. Mary's for hosting us and Arts and Wolf for funding and helping all this come together. Thank you again. My name is Dwayne and have a good show. All right. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, so again, I want to talk to you about nation state uh, proliferation of threats in open source software ecosystems. Um, I'm the chief of research for Phylum. And if you're not familiar with us, I'll give you a brief introduction. We're a Series A startup. We started in COVID. Uh, we're 100% remote from Italy, uh, Europe, not Texas, to California. And we monitor open source software ecosystems for risk because um, the bottom line is we all trust and use software from strangers on the internet. Um, I was just at the Open Source Software Foundation North America, and they had numbers like 98, 99% of all software is open source. And they were like, we won. Great. Um, but this comes with some risks. Strangers who we will never meet, strangers in such vast quantities across every aspect of the software development lifecycle, it is hilariously unlikely that you'll ever truly know the full extent of all the identities and the intentions of every open source software supplier. And so even though open source has a lot of advantages, there's still risks. And so my company uh, classifies these broadly into five domains. First is just malware. Is this package malicious? Is it intended to execute the will of the producer of the software over the consumer of the software? Um, is this package poorly engineered? Does it have any engineering risk? Would a senior engineer send a junior engineer back to go during code review to go fix stuff? Um, are there known vulnerabilities with the package? Uh, this is basically the domain of all software composition analysis tools. This is traditional SCM. And then finally, are there legal risks for commercial enterprises to use certain open source software for license risk? And when you aggregate all these risks, each of these informs an overall picture of a fifth domain of risk, namely author risk. That is, how trustworthy is the purported author of this package? And so that's our risk domains, finally, for what's and a who. And the scope of this problem is immense. Uh, our solution is our automated platform that monitors seven different open source ecosystems. NPM for JavaScript, PyPI for Python, Maven Central for Java, Crates.io for Rust, RubyGems for Ruby, NuGet for C Sharp, and Golang for Go. And any time a new package is published to any one of these seven, Phylum downloads it and analyzes it. And within minutes of publication, our customers have a detailed report of all our findings across these five domains of risk. We also integrate with various CI CD platforms so that developers can immediately know if any package that has or dependency of a package has problems that they should be aware of. And so last year was my first B-Sides and I had the privilege of speaking here and I gave a broad survey of the attacks that the Phylum Research team had uncovered in 2023 with our automated platform. And I gave a lot of real world examples from NPM and PyPI about spammers and scammers and credential stealers and obfuscated code and typo squatters and combo squatters if you've ever heard of that. Um, automated respawning malware on GitHub. Uh, and it was a great talk. I really had a great time being my first B-Sides. That next following week after I left B-Sides, an unusual package hit our platform in NPM. It's called ChartTable.js. Uh, it's a simple package with, as you can see, just two small files, not even 1K of code. Uh, by the way, if you don't know what a combo squad is, this is an excellent example. It's not a typo squad where somebody's fat fingered or something. There is actually a package, albeit unpopular, called ChartTable and the attacker just slapped on a JS to the end because, well, it's JavaScript, and who would, who would be any the wiser? That's what a combo squad is. And so we started looking into this package in the package's metadata file, package.json, and this one looks fairly innocuous. There's really not a lot going on here, except for the unusual pre-install hook that executes as soon as a developer types npm install chart table JS. Um, and so, this hook immediately installs the sync re request dependency and then executes main.js, which is the only other file in the package. So what we find there is also not a lot, just 20 lines of code. Uh, first, they turn off T TLS certificate validation, which just bypasses any certificate checks. And then it creates a hidden directory called cprice in the user's home directory. And after that, after writing that directory name to the console, it calls this bespoke function at the top, check SVN which sends a GET request to that URL and then writes the response to a new file called price token in the directory it just created. And that's it. That's the entire functionality of the package. There is nothing else in the package whatsoever. And so my research team and I had a lot of unanswered questions at this point. As we kept digging through our data for answers, uh, we found another package in NPM that was published just five minutes 
after chart table JS, and it's called ViewWJS. And it's also a similarly small package, albeit a little bigger. And so we started the package.json, and now we find a post install hook, which will, right after you type npm install ViewWJS, will execute main.js. So when we look in main, it's too big to fit on the screen, so I'm going to chunk it up for you here. Again, we find a bespoke function called get price. It's going to send a post request to port 443 to whatever's passed to it. Um, and after it gets rid of, um, after it collects all the chunk response chunks into a single buffer, it's going to write that to the path and file name provided and then immediately execute that file, as you can see on line 25 there. So in this case, after turning off TLS checks again, the Vue.js package looks for the token that the chart table JS package just dropped. And if it's found, it calls get price and the payload is retrieved and executed. So at this point, I'd just like to make a couple observations. First of all, these individual packages don't really look like malware per se, taken individually, one at a time. Uh, they don't really do a whole lot. In fact, one package without the other is totally useless. But taken together, this doesn't pass the smell test at all. Like, this is bad. You get some random token from some server and that you authenticate with to get a payload and then you download and execute it immediately. That is super sketchy. Uh, but I think most important here is that no SCA tool that just scans for vulnerabilities will ever find anything like this at all. Nor will it ever. Um, this code is not vulnerable. There's no CVE associated with any of this. If your organization only scans for vulnerabilities, this kind of activity should give you second thoughts about your organization's security posture. Anyway, we still had some big unanswered questions for my team. And the first one was like, who would ever download any of this? Like, this is dumb. Like, why? It's, it's unlikely that anybody would be fooled by these packages, especially if all they did was just take a look inside. But part of Phylum's success is that nobody ever does take a look inside the things that they install. They just install it and assume everything's gonna be great. How long had this been going on? Was this an isolated event? Are there other packages like this? And finally, who's behind all this? And what's the point, right? This doesn't seem to really do much. Um, and at this point in our investigation, we just didn't have any answers. But the second question was the easiest to answer. So we went back and looked in our data and we found about a dozen pairs of these get post pa package pairs uh, going about six weeks prior. The first two seem to be test packages, but the flurry of activity you can see there in May really seemed to be like a concerted campaign. And with each new pair of packages, the URLs and the directories and the file names would change and maybe some of the identifiers would change a little bit, but the basic structure was all the same each time. And though the package names varied across, across a wide range of topics, as you can see, the identifiers in the code all revolved around a crypto theme. And so as we saw in the, pre as we saw in the previous example, and so as we study the package's evolution, it looked like they were incrementally improving their software each time they published a new package. And so going forward from our initial find, we were able to track new pairs of packages fairly quickly because now we know what we're looking for. Uh, but getting the payload off the server was elusive. We never could be there in time to send that post and get that and see what the next stage was going to do. Uh, it just wasn't up long enough. Uh, moreover, each new pair of packages was published under a new NPM username and email. So these all were throwaway accounts. You couldn't just track one account through here and, and find these packages. Uh, and then on July 11th, the packages just stopped. We still didn't know what was going on. And on the 17th, NPM, all the packages that were still active on NPM were taken down as security holding packages. So they were all gone. Oftentimes, the attackers would take down and unpublish the packages themselves. But many of these stayed up for over a month. But the next day, on the 18th, the Vice President of Security Operations for GitHub, which is NPM's parent company, posted a security alert saying that a social engineering campaign targeting the personal accounts of employees of technology firms. Many of the targeted accounts were connected to blockchain, cryptocurrency, gambling sector, and some people in cybersecurity. And because GitHub has all the registration data for all of their users, they were able to attribute this activity to North Korea. This was Jade Sleet. Um, and now this explains how people would get stumped by this in the first place. They were getting socially engineered, say, hey, I'd, I'd like to join with you on this project. And they would entice a developer to install the packages. And then the game is up because you install the packages and there's nothing left to do after that. You're your host. They also gave us a shout out as well, uh, which was really nice because all we had was the code in the packages. And we were chasing them as best we could. But you know, they didn't. North Korea doesn't sign their stuff, you know, love Kim Jong. Uh, it just, we don't know what they're doing. <laughs> So we, all, we had always suspected that nation state actors would be found in open source, but this was the first time we ever confirmed it. Um, as far as we know, it's the first time last June that any nation state had been found in open source. They've been found in other places plenty, but not acti actively moving in open source ecosystems. So 
After that blog post, we then began coordinating with GitHub security team, uh, sharing findings, but it seemed like that particular campaign really fizzled as soon as they outed the attackers in July. And though we continued looking for Jade Sleep for the rest of the summer and the beginning of the fall, they just remained elusive. They just went quiet as far as we could tell. Until about Halloween. Our automated platform alerted us to the Puma.com package. And this package was nowhere near as sparse uh, as the ones from the spring campaign. You can see there's a lot of files there. Um, but again, starting looking in the package.json file, now we see another unusual pre-install hook. Uh, this time, index.js is what's going to be run and then immediately be deleted as soon as it completes. So looking inside index.js, after you get past some innocuous import statements, you declare these two variables, data and ps data. That's hard to read, so I'm going to beautify that in a moment. But looking at the rest of index.js, it first checks to see if you're running a Windows operating system. And if you are, we're going to write the contents of the data variable to a file called preinstall.bat and ps data to a file called preinstall.ps1. And if those writes are successful, then we're going to execute preinstall.bat, delete it, uh, that is to say the unlinked statement down there. And so now we need to really see what's in those two files that we just wrote. So here's a pretty printed version of preinstall.bat. Uh, first thing to notice is that it's doing its best to suppress output. Turning echo off at the very beginning and all of those redirects says every single command that does any kind of output, we're just going to send that to null. Next, we're going to curl a file from some HTTP server at a hard-coded IP address. We're going to write that to SQLite.a. And if you try to inspect this file that you just wrote, you're not going to find anything but a blob of high entropy garbage, uh, which is usually indicative of some kind of encryption. Stay tuned for that. Next, we're going to launch the PowerShell script preinstall.ps. And note that the execution bi policy bypass is going to run PowerShell without blocking anything and suppressing all warnings. So we're trying to be really, really quiet here. Um, when we pre print the PowerShell script, it looks like this. And this simple script is going to take the SQLite.a file that we just wrote and decrypt it using a single byte key 0xef and write that to SQL.temp. Now, if you inspect this file, now you would find a Windows PE header. And so once we're done, we're going to delete SQLite.a and then return back to preinstall.bat. And now we're just cleaning up after ourselves mostly. The rest of preinstall is just covering its tracks by deleting the PowerShell script that we just used. And then it's going to take our newly decrypted file, rename it to preinstall.db, and call run dll32 to execute an exported function somewhere in there called calculate sum, which passes some mysterious parameter 4906. Once that's done, we're going to delete that file. Finally, we're going to replace our original package.json with some file called pk.json. Now, where'd that come from? Well, if you look back in the original ls of the package, we see that pk.json shipped with our package. And it's just slightly smaller than our original package.json. If we compare the difference between our original package and the one that the script overwrites, you see that the call to the pre-install script is gone. Moreover, the index.js that orchestrated all this, it's gone. Everything is gone. The only thing that would be ever left on your system after you npm install pumacom is whatever the calculate sum function dropped on your machine. And we didn't fully understand this. It, was, it turned out to be a nested, nested, nested set of PEs that's really gnarly, uh, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Still, even though we don't have any of the calling cards from the previous campaign, we still felt like we were chasing a fairly sophisticated actor, maybe even the same ones. Maybe we were back on the trail of Jade Sleep. And so we published our findings on our blog, along with four similar packages that looked and smelled very similar uh, while we were trying to reverse engineer uh, this decrypted DLL. We did end up finding in the same way eight other packages going back to about September 14th. Um, they all had crypto theme names. Nearly one, every single one of them had the same structure, the same subtle changes to identifiers. They were all published under one-time burner accounts for NPM. And we noticed that as we looked across uh, consecutive versions, the number that you passed to calculate sum seemed to increment, uh, like it was being used as a number to track individual targets. Uh, but the hardcoder server IP changed occasionally. Sometimes the decryption key changed, and we were able to track all of those through November. In December, <clears throat> this one came out of nowhere, the Chinese Threat Intelligence Center, Ki An Jin, reported our stuff. And they reported a full-on malware analysis of the PE, the decrypted PE, and they attributed it to the Lazarus group, which as you know or may not know, that was the guys uh, involved in the Sony Pictures hack back in 2014. And so when you 
do a pretty good job of Google translating this to English. They, they show a lot of our work, but they also contribute a lot of their own reverse engineering. There's a lot of either Ida or Ghidra uh, output there. And later in the write-up, they divulge the motive behind these attacks, and that is just simply to steal cryptocurrency. And so now we have not only our actor, but we have our motive, right? Theft. Two weeks later, we get a letter from the UN Security Council panel of experts asking us for more information for their semi-annual report. Uh, this one kind of came out of nowhere, and we just like, no way. This is not, yeah, this, this can't be real. And so we had to like, really extra make sure, like, no, no, really, is that you, UN? No, really, no, really. It was, exactly, exactly. But our contribution to that report led them to conclude that North Korea has stolen about $3 billion worth of cryptocurrency over these past years, which they launder and they pay for their weapons program in circumvention of about a dozen UN resolutions. And so over the course of this part particular campaign, our research team found about three dozen packages uh, through early February of this year. And the actors were getting really good at covering their tracks. They were getting changed things. They were beginning to really, uh, uh, like base 64 encode a lot of the hard coded strings and these sorts of things. Uh, one package in particular that we caught was only alive for 90 seconds. They would publish it as soon as they knew that their victim was hooked, it was yanked and it was gone. We've got it because our platform picks up everything that's, as soon as it's published. But later that month, later in February, our research team began tracking a new set of NPM packages associated with another social engineering campaign, this time targeting software developers with job offers. Hey, we think you're going to make an excellent new senior engineer. If you would but just uh, meet us online and, and download this coding interview exercise, we'd love to interview for our next position. Yeah. Palo Alto Network Unit 42 came back and said, yeah, that's, that's the North Koreans again. Um, because, like I said, we, we don't have the aperture. We don't have any of these user logins. All we have is the code that everybody, any of y'all can get on the internet, and we analyze it. So all of these other locations that have more ancillary information that can help piece these things together, we have to rely on them. Um, there were a few developers that contacted us who got taken in by this scheme. Um, this guy down here who uh, didn't appear that English was his first language, he was pretty fortunate if you can read. He says, they told me that it is for live coding interview software, which I have to install. But before I do it, I found your warning and also read article. Then I resend email, but there is no response from them, their side. We, well, thank you for saving me and lots of job seekers. Thank you again, sir. Um, that, that feels like we're bleeding here. I mean, even if it's just one. Uh, there were some other developers that were not so lucky. They, they went ahead and, and did the coding exercise and they got owned. Well, what are the takeaways here? No code interviews. <laughs> Don't do code interviews, yeah. Right. <laughs> First of all, to get nothing out of this, just understand the threats that are out there. Thank you. Um, these kinds of attacks are really low risk and high reward for the attackers. Uh, oh, by the way, they're nation states. So they like have, compared to you, infinite resources, effectively. Um, they're sophisticated, they're well resourced, they're patient. And their job is to just keep cranking this stuff out and making money for the dear leader. Um, but I have to make this important point because I get this a lot at security conferences. The target here is not the software. The target here is the software developer. It's you, the human, right? And there's, there are technological solutions that can address that, as you know, filing exists for that reason. But this isn't just go find me a buffer overflow and patch that code for me, if you would. Go find the CVE and look it up that somebody made you know, four months ago and they tell me to upgrade to the next newest version. That's not what's the problem here. The problem is that the developer's the target. You're the target. Second, traditional SCA is just not going to cut it and for these types of things. For, it does well what it does. Like, yes, by all means, scan for the vulnerabilities. Do that. Don't stop. But 82% of the malware that we reported in, la in the last quarter, none of them have a GitHub malware advisory associated with them at all. Like, if we assigned a GitHub malware advisory for every single one, we could easily push thousands a week. There's just so much of this stuff out there because it's cheap to script and you just spam all these packages out. None of them, none of the malware that we reported had a CVE associated with them, but 100% of them did something bad on the host machine. And finally, you need a defense in depth approach, right? You need, to, you need to be on the lookout for this type of stuff and you need to know what kinds of things are happening out there because these tactics are always evolving with these attackers. They're never gonna stop. And until we get better at looking where they don't think we're looking, they're going to be able to continue to hide with these. And so that's what my team, the research team, is good at doing. We have a lot of uh, expertise on the offensive and the defensive side of the house based on previous careers that we have. And uh, 
the threat hunting that we're able to do with our automated platform really does, uh, I think, keep us ahead of a lot of the competition who really just throw bodies at this problem. We, we're a really small company, and there are many companies that are orders of magnitude larger than us, and they just have people clicking through one by one packages. We just teach the platform, like, go look for that stuff and tell me what you find and report it up to me and let me know. So, with that, I'll take questions. Yes. So, you talked about NPM, but it's not unique in the running of a pre and post install script, like arbitrary scripts. Um, even if you're downloading raw source code, like configure files for the same thing, right? Um, I see an awful lot of large software projects on the internet that even if they're walking developers through setting up a development environment that's going to be in a local development container, they're still having them locally run Yarn or NPM or pip install or something outside the container. Um, what are your thoughts on, on kind of getting the community to embrace things that, that reduce the rip, like the, the surface that those arbitrary scripts can touch? Yeah. So this is a real friction point, right? Security versus development. Yeah. And we're software developers, right? We, we don't want our builds to break for arbitrary reasons that are out of control. Like, I'll quit my job. Like, I'm, I'm tired of this. I, I've got to go push features for my customers. I don't want your stupid security code. So what we've done is we've integrated the CI CD pipelines. And most of the time, the things that my team raises are just informational warnings. Like, hey, dear developer. I feel like every single vendor link we have is like, dear developer, I know you didn't look at this code, but just so you should know, the author field is empty. They, they didn't tell you who they were. Is that bad? No, it's not bad. But they also didn't give you a description. And they also don't have an entry point. And when you begin to accumulate all these little facts, you begin to be like, do I really want this package in my ecosystem? There are, however, times when we know, for example, that package we know is malware, and that package calls this as a dependency. Break the bill, stop right now, do not pass go, do not let them do it. So it's going to be a tough problem to solve. And, and we're trying to find a way that tells developers, like, we don't want to slow you down, but we also don't want you to just blindly, like, pit install the next thing and hope for the best because that's dangerous. That answer your question? A bit. Okay. Uh, someone up here? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you notice, like, uh, aside from the normal trend of, you know, malware attack service and everything like that, like, um, with AI, chat AI, and everything like that, has that been, uh, been a catalyst to increase the uh, prevalence of it? So, We've looked into this. I haven't yet been convinced that ChatGPT is going to produce good code in enough cases to matter, right? I mean, we've handed it simple obfuscated code, say, dear ChatGPT, tell me what this is doing. And it goes great for a while until it gets to the end, and it just doesn't know what it's doing. Yeah, it's, the, the, the long Markov chain just sort of run out, like, ah, we're, we're just guessing at this point. Um, and that's pretty punishing from a software development standpoint, right? The, the compiler, the interpreter, is like punishing, like, your code must run. And these guys don't really need that. But what they can do, I think, is use AI to really massage these social engineering aspects, which is the more dangerous aspect. So not, not the code per se, but the thing that supports getting the developer to run the code, I think that's going to be a pretty straightforward path. For because, I mean, Chatting, please. What's the regex for this thing? Oh, yeah, that looks good. Fine. And you move on. Like, it's a tool. I don't know any North Koreans that speak English in chat GPT. Well, fair enough, fair enough. Fair. So, uh, question in here somewhere. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, um, in the software development teams I've been involved with, uh, licensing is really important yeah. with open source products. Do you see any correlation between, like, no licenses and these types of attacks? So, like so uh, I find a lot of laziness. Like, these. These attackers have a specific purpose in mind, and getting the license just right is usually more effort than it's worth. Um, like a lot of times, an NPM goes to see ISC, and that's it. and there won't even be a license file. Um, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the approach we have is how we find this stuff in the first place. Right? It's very hard for an attacker to get every single thing right to look like a legitimate package. There's always going to be something that they leave behind that's just like, well, why did you do that? But that seems weird. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying. That seems kind of bad or shy. Um, one of my favorite papers is it's called The Parody is Dead. And it, it goes into this in depth. It was about 10 years ago that these dissidents in closed countries were trying to get out of the internet using Skype like home built things. And what they found out is they never could mimic the Skype protocol well enough that they wouldn't get caught every time. And so, as a threat hunter, as a, as a defender of sorts, I'm just looking for that one way that the attacker's been lazy. Did you do it with a license? Fine. Did you do it with an author? Fine. Did you do it with? 
comments in your code or lack there, like anything that doesn't do what a solid, well-run software engineered pro uh, project looks like, I'm gonna try to find you. And if I can aggregate enough of these weak indicators, I'll probably be able to punch it down pretty quick. Anybody else? I know I'm keeping you for lunch. <laughs> I have some swag down here if you're interested in stickers and whatnot, but I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.